그것이 여러분들께서 질문이나 감이되어 있으면 서명을 내주세요. 너무 긴 사람이 많기 때문에 서명을 우리 진행위원에게 주시고요. 제가 그것을 아, 사회를 보면서 대장마음이 전환된다고 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much for that very warm introduction. I have rewritten my talk about three times in the last two weeks because of events going on in the world. As it is evident to all of you, I'm sure American politics today are in a state of upheaval and confusion. I observe the Korean politics. Uh, perhaps even more so. And I might mention that British politics are just as bad. So what's going on? I know that some dark voices are saying this is the end of democracy, the theory of the world of these opponents, examples of democracy in such deep trouble. They say our three countries have had a good run, but we're now out of steam. They argue that democracy is not efficient enough to deal with today's complex problems. I do not agree. I would not minimize the problems we face. I admit, I admit I'm deeply disappointed and even concerned about the results of the US election. I'm similarly concerned about the Brexit decision in the United Kingdom. And I also observe the Korean as well. The Korea itself is going to be part of the turbulence today, which you understand better than I. But I say, not so fast. Not so fast. Let us not write off democracy. Let us take a longer view of history. For four decades, For a decade, the U.S. stood as a bastion of democracy. During that period, many argued, many argued that the totalitarian system within the Soviet Union was more efficient than democracy. It could, and it produced fearsome military that could be used against us with devastating results. And indeed, that would be drug strike. Instead, the Soviet Union stood. Not because of the actions taken by the United States, but because of internal contradictions in their own system. A political system that did not encourage or allow independent thinking. An economic system that did not reward creativity. So we have learned some lessons in these past four decades. We have learned that democracy in the free market system is vastly superior to any other system around. We've learned, in fact, I think it was Winston Churchill that said, democracy is the worst system, except for all the systems that have tried. So we have a problem that still is the best thing around. But we've also learned that democracy can be messy. You can certainly see that here and in the United States. And we've also learned that the free market system needs some assistance. It needs some regulation to protect the weaker members of society. In the last decade, our free market systems have left behind millions of people, certainly in the United States and in the United Kingdom. And those left behind have been rising in anger, using democracy to throw out the establishment. So the United States and the United Kingdom are in considerable confusion. South Korea problems are different, but frustration in democracy is similar. But to fix those problems, we must use the same democratic institutions that allow them to happen. The democratic institutions, after all, are self-correcting if we only use those features. That is, I believe the people who use some institutions, institutions to create this problem did not use them wisely. But I also believe that we have not seen the last move. Quoting Churchill again, this was during World War II, he said, Americans, Americans will all 
always take the right action after having first exhausted all other possibilities. Well, history supports the view that we will get it right, but not always right away. Look at the results simply. 1950 to 1990 in the United States, and compare them with another regional alternative, which is the Soviet Union, which was better. Or look at the results from 1950 to today in South Korea, and compare them, say, with North Korea. Would any of you argue that North Korea had done better for its people? When South Koreans complain about the weak economy, all they have to do is look north. When they complain about corruption, all they have to do is look north. Of course, when we consider the relative blessings of our freedom and our private economy, we must also recognize that we do not, that they do not, in and of themselves, protect us from outside threats especially military threats. The United States is rightly concerned about a newly aggressive Russia now rebuilding the Cold War as a pure arsenal. I'll have more to say about that later. But I also want to observe now that South Korea is rightly concerned about an aggressive North Korea now building a threatening nuclear arsenal. I don't want to minimize either of these dangers. But neither do I want to be overwhelmed by them. Today, I'm going to talk first about how South Korea should deal with the dangers posed by North Korean nuclear weapons. And they do have nuclear weapons. If you read otherwise, don't believe it. We have an opportunity to deal with this problem at the turn of the last century using the so called Perry process, which has already been referred to today. I still believe that the agreement we negotiated would have given us a very different and certainly safer world than we have today. But when the Bush administration took office in 2001, they cut off all negotiations to the North. Whatever could be said about the reasons for cutting off that negotiation, the results could hardly have been worse. In short, I believe it was an historic missed opportunity. And I also believe that we will never, ever get back to the strong position we had in 2000 when we negotiated that. But today, today, I still hold two strong positions about North Korea, and I want to share them with you. The first is they have no plans to use their nuclear weapons to attack South Korea or Japan, or for that matter, the United States. And second, I believe that it's still possible to negotiate an agreement with North Korea. Not the agreement, not the agreement we negotiated in back 17 years ago, 16 years ago. But one that could considerably reduce the danger posed by the nuclear weapons today. And we should get on with recognizing where we are and do the best we can. When I was working on the Perry process, I put in the report something that is still true today, and I want to repeat it. It said, we should deal with North Korea as it is, not as we would wish it to be. As it is, and as it is today, they have nuclear weapons. We must recognize that and deal with it. However much we may dislike the regime of Pyongyang, they are not suicidal, and they are not irrational. Indeed, they have a clear set of goals. A failure to understand those goals has been led to a dozen years of fruitless negotiations in the Six Party Talks. And if we are to restart negotiations with North, we must do it with a clear understanding <coughs> of those goals. I have commented before that a diplomat should be measured not by his ability to use his mouth, but his ability to use his ears and his eyes to observe and come to conclusions in that. So we have to understand if we negotiate with the North, 
What are they, what are they negotiating with? Who are they? What do they want? What are they trying to do? What are their goals? Because if we don't understand those, we will never succeed. We had that understanding when we used that negotiating with them 16 years ago. Well, the underlying conditions today are very different now that they have a nuclear arsenal. I believe their goals remain the same. I saw again, and I still see today, three goals driving the North Korea regime. The first and the primary one is their desire to sustain the Kim dynasty. To sustain the Kim dynasty. That's an overriding goal of North Korea. They've demonstrated over and over again. Secondly, to gain international recognition. And third, and this is a fourth trip, a weak trip, to improve their economy. The agreements we made in 2000 gave them a chance to achieve all three of those goals without building nuclear weapons. The Bush administration cut off those negotiations early in 2001. And then a few years later joined China in the six party talks. But the ensuing six party talks have made no progress at all since they were not designed to achieve the North Korean goals. So after years of failure of those talks, North Korea decided to put off their, all of their efforts into building a nuclear arsenal as an alternative way of achieving the goals. They reasoned, I think correctly, that the United States and South Korea would not be willing to go to war over the nuclear program. They reasoned that a nuclear arsenal would give them deterrence against an allied military attack, which they believed correctly could not be achieved by their large but poorly equipped military forces. In fact, I believe that South Korean forces alone, even without the assistance of the U.S., are probably possible of defeating the North Korean military forces. Adding the U.S. forces to that, they get another contest. So in effect, their nuclear program allowed them to achieve their first two goals, survival of the dynasty and international recognition. But they did that at a very substantial cost to the third goal. Not only because of the cost of the nuclear program, but the cost imposed by the sanctions. So, while their goal of improving their economy was important to them, it is absolutely clear by their actions that it is entirely subservient to the first two goals. I believe that that is a fair assessment for what has driven North Korean decisions these past few decades. If we are to succeed in future negotiations, reduce the danger posed by the nuclear weapons, we must be guided by failures of the past. A key tenet of the process, I want to repeat again, we must deal with North Korea as it is and not as we wish it to be. And that is still true. For what North Korea is today is very different from what it was 16 years ago. So the incentives and the disincentives we offered them would not be effective today. We cannot, I believe, expect them to give up the nuclear weapons. They have already demonstrated that they are willing to endure the worst sanctions we could impose to maintain the nuclear option because they believe it is essential to maintaining their primary goal of sustaining the Kim dynasty. But they may very well accept significant limitations on their nuclear ambitions in order to gain their third goal of improving their economy. Some years ago, Dr. Sig Hacker of Stanford proposed what he called the three no's. No new nukes, no better new nukes, and no transfer of nuclear weapons or technology. But it was never accepted as a basis for negotiations. An updated version of that three no's might very well be a basis for negotiations today, where we offer step by step incentives in return for step by step with those numbers. I believe that it's not beyond our diplomatic skills 
to formulate such a new diplomatic approach. I cannot be confident that such an approach would be effective, but it could hardly be less effective than all of our previous approaches taken during the six party talks. The question in my mind is not whether a new diplomatic approach is what it not, but whether our two governments, the American government and the South Korean government, will be willing to try a new one. Much is at stake. As I've said, I do not believe that the North Korean regime would make a planned attack on South Korea or Japan, since that would lead to the destruction of North Korea and, of course, the Kim Dynasty. But their nuclear arsenal could very well involve North Korea to take other non nuclear actions that are still provocative. And such actions could spin out of control. All the leaders and escalate them to a war that could eventually escalate them to a nuclear. That is the danger, not the danger that North Korea is going to launch an attack. Now, Having said all that, let me back away from the Korean issue, look more broadly at the dangers, nuclear dangers in the world today. This is the subject of the book, which you have heard described. And I wrote the book because I'm convinced of one overriding fact, and that is that the likelihood today of a nuclear catastrophe somewhere in the world is greater than it was during the Cold War greater than during the Cold War. And because we don't, we, the public, here in South Korea, in the United States, of Europe, do not understand that. We are not taking the actions that we could take to reduce and degrade reduce those dangers. The dangers, again, are not the dangers that Russia would attack the United States in this way today, or vice versa. Or the China conducted nuclear attack, or the North Korea conducted nuclear attack. None of these leaders is suicidal. We're not going to do that. The danger to it in the nuclear war. Let me just cite two incidents in history. So if you think that I'm exaggerating the danger to Blunder, at least I have some historical factual basis for it. The dangers we thought during the Cold War for that the Soviet Union was planning a massive surprise attack against the United States. Now, years after the Cold War is over, we realized that was an exaggerated danger. They had the same danger and was equally exaggerated on their part. But the, the were real dangers, the real dangers, the danger of an accidental war or the danger of a war by miscalculation. I am old enough that I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis. Indeed, I was an active participant in preparing the intelligence reports for President Kennedy, which, on which he based his decisions to this to that. So I'm very scared of that. After the event was over, he reported, he told reporters that he believed it was one chance in three, one chance in three, that the Cuban Missile Crisis would erupt into a nuclear holocaust which would essentially wipe out our civilization. My response to that was Kennedy was an optimist. He was an optimist because he didn't know when he said that of some dangers which we didn't, because our intelligence didn't know we couldn't tell him. We didn't know, for example, that at the time that they were putting the long medium range and long range missiles in Cuba, they already had tactical nuclear weapons in Cuba, with the nuclear weapons already on them, and with the commanders of the missiles with authorization to use them. And so if Kennedy had accepted the unanimous recommendation of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to mount a conventional invasion of Cuba, our forces would have been on the beach with a tactical nuclear weapon that was essentially eliminated. Not only that, it would undoubtedly have triggered a general nuclear war, affecting the whole world. So that's my assessment of what I mean by blundering into a nuclear war, not a war, a nuclear war by miscalculation. Beyond that, we had during the Cold War the possibility of a nuclear war by accident. When I was the Under Secretary of Defense, I was awoke at 3 o'clock in the morning 
who called from the panel of the North American Air Defense Command. And the first thing he said to me, did I sleep with him against the phone? Because my computers are showing 200 ICBMs on the way to the Soviet Union to the United States. I was very sleepy when I picked up the phone and I immediately, immediately woke up. He then went on happily to say, but he had concluded it was a false alarm. And he was calling me at the time I was then the Defense for Research and Engineer. So why was he calling me? He was calling me because he knew he had to fix the president the next morning. He wanted to get to the president of the world and he wanted to go his computer so I would happen to be able to figure that out. Well, the sequel of that story is I was not able to move over the phone. It took us three days to finally figure out what had happened, which was when the shift changed that night, the computer operator mistakenly <coughs> instead of putting the operating table to the computer, put in a training tape, which simulated a very realistic operation. <coughs> it was human error. A similar event happened in 1982 in the Soviet Union, where the watch officer got a similar kind of report from his computer. This watch officer was happened to be a computer operator. He understood the computer sometimes made mistakes. And he was very skeptical. He refused to pass the message up to the president, who might very well have taken it seriously. Uh, it turned out to be a false alarm. And he subsequently put them book and a documentary made up called The Man Who Saved the World. So he did save the world. What was his reward for that? His superiors recommended him for not following his instructions. So humans still err, machines still err. We in Russia still have a policy called launch on warning. And so we're still susceptible. We're still susceptible to blundering into the war, the world is kind of blazing. And beyond those two problems in the Cold War, we now have the possibility of a nuclear terror act. I would say a rather high probability of a nuclear terror act sometime in a few years. And the possibility of a regional nuclear war, for example, in Vietnam and Pakistan. With that good news, let me just pause and say, what are we doing about all this? What are we doing to lower those dangers? What we're doing instead of lowering the dangers is we're repeating all of the mistakes we made during the Cold War. Russia is busy building up a whole new generation of nuclear weapons and bragging about it, and threatening the neighbors with it, and threatening the United States with it. The head of Russian media made a very famous television interview, which he said, and I quote him, Russia is the only nation capable of turning the United States into radioactive ash. Well, of course, that is a true statement. The question is, why in the world do you think that was a worthwhile thing for him to say over public <coughs> television? In the, of course, the United States is not going to be built out done in this business of building people until we're now starting to rebuild our Cold War nuclear arsenal. The most recent cost estimate of that is over the next 20 or 30 years, we will spend about $1 trillion on our nuclear weapon and operating them. Now, the number of a trillion dollars, I'm sure, doesn't mean anything to any of you. The number is so vast that you can't really comprehend it. There's a lot of money. The money, in my mind, is not the biggest issue. The biggest issue is it's just one more step of increasing the danger putting us back in a Cold War thinking, Cold War mentality, and going back to Cold War dangers. I'm just going to say one more thing about the dangers of the day. And that is, I think, the reason we are blundering into these positions is that people do not understand the dangers. They do not understand that today we're facing greater dangers than we faced during the Cold War. And so to me, while I'd like to be out there being politically active and fomenting that action among them, I understand we're not going to, in a democracy, we're not going to get action as people understand. So I'm dedicating the rest of my life to educating this problem. The first part of that education was the book that you heard about. 
living at the nuclear thing, which is a selective memoir about that part of my life in which I've been involved with nuclear issues and why it has affected my thinking so profoundly and then so concerned with this problem. I want to share that with the rest of the world and get them to continue to understand it so they can vicariously benefit from my own experiences. So the book came, came out some months ago in the United States. Uh, the first non-English edition was just released a few days ago in Korea. And it's now available to any of you who want to read the Korean edition. It's a very lovely edition, by the way. And I met with the publisher today and thanked him for the great job he's done on the book. The book has now been, they just finished the translation to Chinese. Now we're going over there in a few months to launch the book in China. And there's a Russian edition in the process of being translated right now. We expect it's going to be very hot sometime in the second or third quarter of next year. We're going to Russia to publicize that. And finally, we hope to have a Japanese edition of it. So it's an, it's an international problem. We need an international edition. But, 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 how many people read books today? A <laughs> few tens of thousands, I'll congratulate myself. <laughs> and this is a mass education problem. So all of my efforts today, all the efforts we will target to the today, are directed at mass education. How do you get the ideas and the issues and the stories of the book across to a mass audience and the answer is not books, not lectures, not papers, but the internet. And so I have taken the course that I've been teaching Stanford on the subject and have made out of it what is called a MOOC. That has to be the worst acronym I've ever had. It stands for Massive Open Online Course. So right now, and by the way, we're in the fifth week of that course. And if, if any of you want to take the course, you can do so. It's free, and there are no quizzes. <laughs> so I encourage you to go to our website, click the right button, and it'll, it'll give you an opportunity to see the first few lectures of the course and decide whether you want to take the whole course. So that's one thing we're doing. I hope so far there are about 3,000 people coming up with the course, and I'm hoping that the number is up to hundreds of thousands of times. We're making four more smaller books, which I call mini books, dealing with smaller aspects of the subject, and hopefully we want to engage with people who want to get introduced to the subject who want to commit themselves to a full one quarter, one semester course. And finally, we're making little videos uh, for YouTube. Little five minute, six minute video drawn by various aspects of this point. The one we already have out, and again, if you go to our website and you click the right button, you'll get this six minute video played. It the dramatizes a nuclear terrorist getting bomb and set it up in Washington, D.C. It's a uh, pretty scary scenario. Quite realistic, but very scary. But it's not just, not just. 80,000, 100,000 people get killed. It's the social, the economic, and the political, absolute disastrous consequences that stem from that. And the YouTube video is set in Washington. It could be Moscow. It could be London. It could be Seoul. So if you don't get the book, you don't get the course. At least look at that six minute video. It's worth six minutes of your time to be convinced this is a scary problem. But all in all, uh, I and my little project are working very hard on this problem of educating the world on how dangerous things are. Not because we don't scare them, because I profoundly believe that the significant and realistic actions we can take to greatly lower that danger. And as soon as we understand what the danger are, as we are democracy, we'll start taking those actions to the necessary. I thank you very much. <laughs>